When I close my eyes, I can still see our old home, sitting out on that quiet Vermont cul-de-sac. The street had only one other house, forever under construction, and the next nearest neighbor was a half mile down a dirt road through the woods that we would wander. My younger sister, Gemma, and I came to know the woods around us as well as we knew our own home. When we stood outside, we felt well and truly alone. But nobody believed the stories we told about it. One Christmas break, my mom's sister and her family came over for a three-day trip. Aunt Barb was as different from my mom as her sister could be, and we teens as well. While my sister and I were free spirits with little guidance, our cousins Jack and Ellie were strictly regimented, even during winter break with a family. So, when Auntie Barb had too much eggnog and knocked out in the basement, Jack and Ellie were only too happy to indulge in a small act of rebellion. They dropped their books and begged us to take them exploring out in the white woods. Come on, Gemma, Brooke, Ellie pleaded. I don't want to spend my whole vacation studying. Mom will never notice, and Dad's working in the den. We didn't take much convincing. Everyone bundled up, and we headed out to see our favorite winter site, the frozen waterfall at the property line. It was just a little one, feeding into the brook, but it was a sight you could only see in winter, the graceful movement of water frozen in time. That's it? asked Jack, when we finally arrived. Fifteen minutes of hiking in the cold just to see this? There's hardly even a waterfall. I bet there's a bigger fall on the rock ledge over there, said Ali. Gemma and I shivered, and not from the cold. No, said Gemma. We don't go over there. Well then, now's the perfect time, Ali cheered, dashing away with Jack running after her. No, wait, I called out but they ignored me. They ran through the snow, laughing and whooping as Gemma and I chased after them. But I lent Ali my snow boots. I was slipping in my sneakers with every step. By the time we could see the mouth of the cave in the rock wall, the two were breathless with excitement. Damn, yelled Jack. Take a look at that. Get back here, I shouted. We don't go there, Gemma said, grabbing each by the arm. Why? asked Jack. What's in there? Gemma's eyes darted to me as I stumbled along, looking for an explanation. I pulled our cousins away from the entrance, only daring to speak when we'd retreated back to the tree line. They call it a wendigo, I murmured. Jack burst out laughing. What, it's nine feet tall with antlers? Some supernatural crap here? Should I call Sam and Dean? My lips trembled, and I fought a frown. I'm not kidding, and we aren't monster hunters. That means it's actually dangerous. Come on, said Gemma. Let's go back to the path. Jack and Ellie started to follow, but as soon as I released Jack's arm, he was running back to the cave, hooting and hollering like it was some kind of game. Jack, get the hell over here, I demanded, running after him. When he approached the mouth of the cave, though, he stopped dead in his tracks. He turned around, white as polished bone, gagging as he stumbled back to the tree line. The stench of rotten blood was heavy in the air. Though Jack didn't say a word, I understood what he was feeling. As we walked away, I swore that I heard sniffing from inside the cave. That night, the family gathered around to play board games, but Jack just sat in the corner of the room, silent as snowfall, his eyes wide. There was blood where his lips should be, Brock, Jack whispered when I sat beside him. I only nodded. The image of the bone-pale man with a bloody gash for a mouth flashed in my mind the unhealed sores gaping on his legs, the jagged ribs that bruised his thin skin, the smell of decay. I shook it away. You can forget about it, I told him. Tomorrow's Christmas, and then you'll be heading home. 
Jack just shook his head. Forget? How could I forget the first time I saw a monster? He shot up from his seat, green in the face, and darted to the bathroom. The next morning, I woke up early and went out to tend the chickens. As I made my way to the coop though, unease washed over me. The chickens were terrified, cackling over and over, shivering in the corner of the coop. Shh, shush, shush, I cooed, reaching down to pick up Tandoori, my favourite. But a deep pain shot at my arm. With a cry, I dropped her. Tandoori had bitten my hand and ran back to the others, huddling for safety. Rudy, the rooster, puffed up his breast feathers, strutting between me and the hens. I spread out some feed and closed their coop tight, not even bothering with the eggs. My hand was bleeding good, throbbing and red. As I stepped outside though, I forgot about the pain entirely. The paranoia that something was wrong blared alarms in my mind. My senses were on high alert for anything out of place. That's when I noticed the footprints in the snow. Not mine. Not my family's either. Not unless they went outside barefoot. And the footprints led straight to the broken basement window. I felt my heart drop. My blood ran cold. And then, I heard a scream. I raced through the front door, my eyes darting to find anything amiss. Everything looked fine, the tree glittering with ornaments, the gifts wrapped and piled below it. But I wasn't going crazy. Gemma had sped down the stairs from her bedroom. Did you hear that? She whispered. Where's mom and dad? I think they're in the greenhouse, I said through a tremble. Another scream clamoured. Brooke! Gemma! The tone was so blood-curdling, so haggard, that I almost didn't recognise it as Ali. Quick footsteps pounded up the basement steps. A desperate gasp at the doorknob rattled it, followed by a loud thud. Please! Ali's voice was closer this time, ragged and throaty. Gemma grabbed the fire iron, and I grabbed a kitchen knife as we approached the basement door. Ali still screaming. We locked eyes counted the three, then opened the door. There, on the other side, was Ali. Her face was dripping with blood. A red gouge split her forehead. Help me, she screamed, gripping the handrail for her very life. Help me. Below her was Aunt Barb, her lips bitten and bleeding, her face crazed, her skin ashen. She gripped Ali's leg her nails tearing into its meat. Her tongue stretched out of her jagged mouth, reaching for a taste of Ali's blood. She stopped by Jack, who clenched his arms around Barb's waist, pulling with all his might to keep her off the stairs, desperate to help his sister. Meanwhile, Uncle Dave laid on the floor, crumpled like a doll and bleeding. Gemma and I took one of Ali's hands and hoisted her up the final three steps, Barb's now scraped down her leg. As Ali escaped a grasp, Auntie Barb fell backward onto Jack, knocking them both to the ground. She jolted wildly, her elbows swinging left and right, pounding him in the face. Blood poured from his nose. I held up a finger to him. Wait, I mouthed, and closed the door. Get my parents from the greenhouse, I told Ali. Then I turned to Gemma. Get the chain. Ali hobbled out of the kitchen door toward the greenhouse, while Gemma and I scrambled to collect anything we could use. All the while, the wild thrashing and screeches of my aunt shot through the house, punctuated by shouts from Jack. Gemma held out the chain, and I gripped the brulee torch from the kitchen. We heard frantic calls from Jack downstairs. Hurry! Again, we counted to three and swung open the door, but only Uncle Dave's body laid at the bottom of the stairs. We scurried down as silent as possible, checking our corners. A putrid smell assaulted our nostrils, the smell of death and corruption. Then, we heard a shout. When we rounded the corner from the stairs, we saw them. Auntie Barb biting into Jack's arm. 
He wrenched away, a gash forming on his arm. Jack slammed to the floor, dragging himself to us. Finally, Barb acknowledged us, her wild eyes roving over us, estimating us with the concern of a trapped animal. I fired up the torch, and Barb flinched backward. Her head spun in search of an exit. Then, she fixed on the broken window. Below it lay the forsaken body of the original Wendigo, its stench filling the room. Barb rushed Gemma, pushing her to the ground, then lunged for the window. Gemma sprang up and hurled the weighted end of the chain at Auntie Barb, catching her by the leg. Barb shrieked, hoisting herself up through the window, skidding Gemma down to the ground. I can't hold her, Gemma yelled. I jumped to the ground beside her and grabbed onto the chain too. Even with both of us pulling, with all our might, Barb still dragged us across the floor, rug burns grating our skin. But then, a screech erupted, so loud and terrible that I thought my head would burst. My father, from outside the window, had stabbed Barb's hand with a silver-plated knife. Then my mother forced the silver pendant in Barb's mouth, holding it closed. A rush of icy air swept through the basement and out of the window. Finally, Auntie Barb collapsed from exhaustion as warmth returned to her skin. The original body of the Wendigo dissolved away into ash, and, we can only hope, its spirit evaporated with it. Still, for good measure, we restrained Barb until an ambulance was able to come. Dave had a concussion, but ultimately survived. Jack and Ali each recovered physically, despite their nasty infections, albeit with scars. Auntie Barb was held in the ICU, malnourished, dehydrated, and raging with infection. When she recovered, she couldn't recall at all what had happened. Ali had told me though, the Wendigo, apparently having caught Jack's scent, tracked him to our basement. My guess is that it wanted a new host. The smell of decay was heavy on its old body. And Jack was young and strong. And then, well, for our flaws, when Auntie Barb saw that monster charging toward her son, she threw herself in the way and absorbed the Wendigo spirit in Jack's place. It might be easy to blame Jack for all of this, but I really feel for him. After all, how was he ever supposed to learn that there are consequences for his actions if he was never allowed to choose his actions. He'd been so isolated, so desperate for any amount of freedom, that he couldn't even conceive of limits to his behaviour. He had no idea how dangerous freedom could be, what responsibilities came along with it. But now, he's learned his lesson, and it's the kind he won't soon forget.